I knew it was an important mission because I had a one-star and a two-star general brief me on what they expected. A totally irrational move and a totally unexpected move. I was completely taken aback. Consternation. Disbelief. The Air Force kept wanting to bomb. It's going to be a blockade. The blockade is an act of war. We are preparing for the possible Third World War. They were one step away from a nuclear war. One step away. One step away. How close did we come to nuclear war? We were close, quite close to nuclear war. It is just 90 miles from the coastline of Cuba to the coastline of the United States. It would take only three minutes for a nuclear missile fired from Cuba to strike Miami, and only a few minutes more to strike elsewhere in the United States. Good evening, I'm Maria Shriver. 30 years ago tonight, President John F. Kennedy signed a proclamation that brought the United States and the Soviet Union to the edge of nuclear war. Just eight days earlier, he had learned that the Soviets had secretly installed nuclear missiles in Cuba. He was stunned, and he knew he had to take action. It was the height of the Cold War. Nikita Khrushchev ruled in the Soviet Union, Fidel Castro was in power in Cuba and had formed a strong relationship with the Soviets. John Kennedy had been president less than two years, and he was still smarting from his biggest blunder in office, the Bay of Pigs the 1961 invasion of Cuba by U.S.-backed Cuban exiles. Castro responded by allowing the Soviets to put ballistic missiles on his island. This is the real story of the Cuban Missile Crisis. It is the terrifying story of how the courage and the character of two men, John Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev, averted a catastrophic nuclear exchange only at the very last minute. We begin Sunday, October 14, 1962, as Air Force Major Richard Heiser takes off in his U-2 spy plane on a routine photo mission over Cuba. Well, the mission was from Edwards Supply Direct on a direct route south of Cross Coast, Texas, over the Gulf of Mexico, south of Cuba, turn due north, fly across the Isle of Pines, across the San Cristobal area, one path, and straight into Orlando. They briefed me at the time uh, that they did have sand pipes and uh, they had no idea whether they would fire or not. Just prior to crossing the Cuban coast, you've already had the cameras warmed up and ready to start taking pictures. I knew it was an important mission because I had a one-star and a two-star general brief me on what they expected. Majors aren't used to being briefed prior to a mission by generals directly. One of them said, Heiser, when you get on the ground at Orlando, I'm going to be there to pick up your film. And he was there. We worked all through the night. And uh, the next morning, went over the photographs. Shortly after noon, we found two areas that were very suspicious. Now, at first, they thought they might be surface-to-air missile sites, but when they started measuring the uh, materials, they were much larger. The uh, SA-2 is about 34, 35 feet, and these objects were turning out to be 65 feet long. And so I start flipping through the book on the SS-4, and when I showed Jay Quintrell the photograph of the missile as seen in the streets of Moscow, he said, that's it, that's it. 
it, it was a tense moment because we knew uh, that this was going to involve the president, certainly. I went to inform the president. And he was still uh, finishing up breakfast in the newspapers in his uh, bedroom, and I told him. He was really quite cool. He was uh, shocked, and it was. Uh, there was a sense that, uh, you know, this was an unexpected and a very difficult and a very unpleasant challenge from uh, Nikita Khrushchev. Both publicly and privately, in the most secret kinds of uh, communications, the Khrushchev had personally assured him that the Soviets were not up to anything special in Cuba. I was wondering whether I should raise the matter with Khrushchev. Now I said, look, I think this is a very, very risky decision. And his reply was, uh, he said, well, we aren't breaking any uh, international law. We're doing what the Americans have been doing all along, uh, placing uh, nuclear missiles along our perimeter. Khrushchev said we needed full secrecy and that the Americans would just have to swallow the pill when we tell them everything is already in place. At that moment, we were highly confident of the Soviet Union and we trusted them. We trusted that they knew how to do things. But if what I had proposed had been done, that is to make public the agreement and act openly, then things would have been different. We immediately started working on details, like preparing troops, loading troops, amassing troops in ports, plans on camouflage and disinformation, which was very important. It was all done secretly. First, we loaded the anti-aircraft divisions, then the motorized regiments, and then the missile divisions. When we added it all up, it turned out we had some 45,000 troops there. We put 2,000 servicemen aboard a luxury liner and placed an article in a newspaper saying that for the first time, a beautiful ship with Soviet tourists on board was heading for Cuba. But if you look closely at those tourists, you would have seen that most of them had shaved heads. I was the captain of the Ali Pius. The ship had been loaded with tanks, missiles, and military equipment. One ship carried missiles. Another one just warheads. No one ship carried a missile ready to be launched. We passed American ships on our trip and talked to them about where they were going and so on. We even exchanged gifts. They asked what we were doing there and we said, well, we're training. All this time we were being escorted by submarines. They were right underneath us. The launchers and the missiles themselves were unloaded only at night and were transported accompanied by the Cuban militia. So during the day, no missiles or launchers could be seen. If at night they couldn't reach their destinations, they'd stop at a certain place, camouflage them and wait for the next night. So we had a very tough job maintaining secrecy. When somebody saw something, when somebody knew something, we had to isolate them. I was completely taken aback. I didn't believe it for a moment. I mean, I didn't believe that, that they would do that. A totally irrational move and a totally unexpected move. Consternation, disbelief. Uh, I, I uh, couldn't have uh, been more surprised if it hadn't been for the factor that we'd, we'd been led into something by being double-crossed, by being, uh, something being done behind our back the feeling might not have been as intense. One of the first steps that was taken when the missiles were discovered was to get U.S. fighter aircraft into position so that they could attack Cuba if necessary. At the same time, the naval forces began to move closer to Cuba so that they could launch aerial attacks on people from carriers. I had a White House white phone in my bedroom, 
And this morning, it was Mrs. Kennedy on the phone, and I knew something really had to be up because she would never call me at that hour. And her voice was strangely nervous and tense. And she said, Tish, you better come on down right now. There's real, real trouble afoot. We must cancel all engagements. We must not tell anyone why we're doing it. The house just closed up like a great flower. There was total silence. The president called me to his office and told me that he was calling a meeting for that morning at 11.45 in the cabinet room, that he wanted me to attend that meeting along with a dozen other of his advisors. The president was cool, almost cold, and cold was his way of showing anger very crisp, very deliberate, very businesslike. He wanted to know what he had said on the record, and he wanted me to prepare for this meeting at which the alternative means of removing those missiles would be considered. When the president came in, we all stood up, and good morning, Mr. President. He was very serious. It was disorderly on the first hour. As you can imagine, there were all kinds of, of hypotheses and suppositions about what this might imply, what the real significance of it was. There was a feeling that we had to do something decisive. Uh, just what we were going to do was difference of opinion. That's what the, where the split was. One day, uh, it came out in my office, the president, and he said, I want to put in a taping system. But he pushed a button on his desk, and the light went on, I knew to turn it on. What is their range? We told them their range. When we told them we believe these are SS-4s from every evidence we have. The range is roughly a thousand kilometers, and well, how far does that reach? Well, that reaches Washington. We then began a consideration of alternatives, and we began a speculation of Khrushchev's motives. There must be some major reason for the Russians to uh, set this up as a, uh, must be, they're not satisfied with their ICBMs. But it makes the launching base, uh, or a short range missile against the United States, or something like that, or rather cut the ICBM system. Right from the beginning, the Joint Chiefs believed that uh, the only way to solve that problem was militarily, which was the use of, of military force before those uh, missiles became operational. Those who believed the military balance had been changed were inclined to favor a military action, an air attack, and they were honest enough to say that the air attack against the missile base in Cuba almost surely would have to be accompanied by a land and sea invasion. Those of us who believed the military balance had not been changed favored other action, a quarantine. I could see this getting out of hand getting out of hand even in uh, among my own colleagues. This very large and sudden and surreptitious movement of nuclear missiles to positions 90 miles from our shore where they were capable of reaching the United States, Latin America, some parts of Canada was clearly a highly provocative act and it meant potentially the first nuclear confrontation in world history. That was the risk that was in the president's mind and it was in the mind of some of the others of us when we were trying to decide between these two courses, quarantine or attack. Of course, one and more the uh, one and everybody, and, I, and obviously you can't sort of out in four days from now, you've got to take them out. They may announce in three days they're going to have warheads on them. If we come and attack, they're going to fire them. What do we do? Then we don't take them out. The president himself said to all of us, I do not want anyone else in government outside this room to know that we know what the Soviets are up to. After the Bay of Pigs, supplies of weapons from the Soviet Union continued. But in addition, tanks, planes, artillery, and the aircraft weapons were also supplied. Nikita Khrushchev set as the goal the defense of Cuba from aggression by the U.S. because we were receiving information that the U.S., the Pentagon, on orders from President Kennedy, had started drafting a military operation against Cuba 